This is uh, a small introduction. So, Professor Choi, to talk about pelvic lymph node dissection. Thank you very much. Uh, still a little bit TG because we went to <laughs> third round after second round with uh, Chuchip. <laughs> Anyways, uh, our same topic I uh, had yesterday, so I have to repeat what I said. Um, the lateral pelvic nodes, the, the you know, topic said P, L, and D. I thought there's a para-aortic lymph node dissection, <laughs> but it's actually it's a lateral pelvic node dissection. I, and I have to <laughs> repeat that this. Again, lateral pelvic node dissection is uh, um, a demanding procedure in skill-wise, but if you have very good concept of the anatomical landmark, it is not that much difficult. Maybe uh, Professor Sakai may agree that. So we uh, developed the systematized lateral pelvic nose. So this is the right side of the pelvis. If you uh, divide on this right side of pelvis into three uh, plane, and you may have a two different group between the three planes. The innermost, most medial part is we say just uh, uh, plane A. The outermost, uh, the most lateral part is plane B. In between, is the internal iliac artery and the tributaries, plane C. The loop is urinary bladder, is a plane D. Bottom is the uh, bony pelvis. So between plane A and C is internal iliac group. Between plane B and C is obturator group. So final goal is remove limper areolar tissues, all these area, and but preserve arteries, nerves, and something more important thing. So this is how we do uh, systematically. So this is uh, A, the plane A, which contains ureter and the pelvic sprinkling nerves. Pelvic sprinkling nerve is not the pelvic nerve. Is a pelvic nerve, you, you may sometimes confuse pelvic nerve, is not this pelvic sprinkling nerve. Pelvic plexus uh, is the connection of a pelvic sprinkling nerve plus hypogastric nerve. Uh, so it is not it's communicated with the small branches, but not the direct communication with the sacral nerves. And plane B is external iliac artery. The medial part of external iliac artery and vein, the plane C is internal iliac arteries. Between plane C and B is one very straight, large nerve you can meet is the obturate nerve. So, Just I will show you the right side of the uh, lateral pelvic node dissection. Please. Okay, we are developing the plane A, actually, it's so containing the ureter. You can see here is ureter. Um, go for first. You see the ureter? and the very thin membrane. 
you develop. And you can see the pelvic sprunkling of this area. Once you developed plane A, and I'll move to the plane B. Sectional iliac vessels. Here, external iliac vein and pelvic floor muscles. Not the pelvic floor, it's sidewall muscles. We developed this plane as much as I can, as deep as I can. And then we'll move to another plane along the internal iliac artery and its uh, branches. This is the uh, uh, umbilical artery going to the uh, superior vesical artery. And we developed this one as well as as deep as you can go. You just uh, dissect it down to the, uh, the lower level. And once you developed all these three planes, we started to dissect lateral pelvic nerve dissection from the bifurcation of the internal iliac and external iliac, like this. That is the obturate nerve, obturate area. And you can see the obturate nerve just underneath the, this part. Carefully dissect, not to injure nerve or vessels. You can cut the vessels, but unless there's no uh, tumor invasion, I try to preserve the vessels as well. And this is a roof of the, uh, uh, the lateral pelvic node. This is uh, the urinary bladder. And we dissect and remove. See, this is a uh, obturate canal. It's going into the obturate canal. The obturate nerve is here. Obturate artery and vein is traversing parallel to the nerve. And then we move to the internal iliac compartment. Oop. Internal iliac compartment. So this is internal iliac arteries. This is internal iliac vein. Between the plane A, which contains the pelvic sprunkling nerve, and the internal iliac arteries, we remove all the lymphariolar tissues until you can see the last branch of the internal iliac artery, which is the pudendal arteries. And then you, you may complete uh, the lateral pelvic nose uh, dissection. And as I mentioned yesterday, to, uh, we adopted two techniques. One is ICG, fluorescence imaging. Second one is three, 3D CT reconstruction. ICG is to confirm the completeness of lateral pelvic node dissection, not to see the lymph node. To confirm the, limp, the completeness of the lymph node dissection, when you remove that and then reconfirm that you cannot see any green fluorescence uh, positive lymph node, the 3D reconstruction is only to identify the suspicious lymph node to send them to the pathology to prove which is uh, positive or negative. So this is one of the example. Suspicious lymph node is here, internal iliac artery, and the terminal branch of the internal iliac artery. There are two suspicious lymph nodes. So we are targeting, remove all the lymph nodes, all the lymph nodes, but we are targeting these suspicious lymph nodes, and we found, and then sent them to the pathology to see 
whether this is really a uh, positive or negative. So this is uh, one of the examples. When I start, there are from time to time we, we check the uh, fluorescence and the uh, 3D reconstruction simultaneously. And you may see this is a lymph node, and then uh, we can match the uh, anatomical uh, position for, uh, with the 3D reconstruction and uh, the ICG. And then we mark this one with some clip. And this is uh, index lymph node one. And then we dissect more and more to targeting the, the last part, the lymph node in the last part of the internal iliac artery, which is uh, index lymph node two. And then finally we checked, uh, this is the target lymph node, and remove it. Here you can see. the exactly matching to the 3D reconstruction and the real anatomical uh, landmarks. And then we uh, mark again with, with a clip and we send to the pathology for uh, the positive or negative. So that's it, my technique, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Choi. Uh, wonderful video. We will move now with the uh, next presentation to talk about uh, TME and ISR. He's a former, uh, the past president of the Philippine Society of Colorectal Surgeons and the head of colorectal surgery in Philippine General Hospital, Dr. Noneng Monroy. Good morning. Uh, thank you to Chip and to the, your team to the Long Corn Colorectal Surgery. It's a big honor to be part of the celebration. I'm tasked to talk about uh, TME and ISR uh, on minimally invasive approach. I have no di disclosures except for I learned from the masters and experts of colorectal MIS back in 2006. It was Stu Chip and Jirawat who really encouraged me to learn laparoscopic approach by participating in their cadaver workshop, laparoscopic cadaver workshop in this uh, prestigious center. Subsequently, Michael Lee helped us in our division by assisting in a number of our laparoscopic colorectal procedures, and we were able to visit together with Rami Rojas, visit Pamil Malayud for one week. And then also learn from observing the live demonstrations and lectures of the experts, Professor Junji Kim, William, and Professor Lerwa from Strasbourg. I think it's the best way to learn a new procedure, particularly complex procedure, really to learn from the expert and observe them while they work. So laparoscopic TME with intracorporeal anastomosis and laparoscopic TME with ISR are the procedures for mid and low rectal cancer. For laparoscopic TME, it's usually indicated for mid and some low rectal lesions, but for ISR, it's usually reserved for low rectal lesions. I will not talk about the benefits and the evidence of uh, the laparoscopic approach. It was well discussed yesterday. Just focus on the technical points of TME and ISR. Professor Eric Ruillier from Bordeaux, France, uh, published in DCR 2013 um, about classification of low rectal cancer. 
uh, those lesions less than 6 cm from the anal verge in order to give us a clear-cut indications of ISR. So they classified low rectal lesions into four. One is the type 1, supraanal, more than one, one centimeter from the anal rectal ring or your puberectalis. Type 2 is ju juxtaanal, less than one centimeter from your puberectalis or anal rectal ring. Type 3 is intraanal, and type 4 is transanal. And they recommend that for type 1, you do coloanal anastomosis. For type 2, you do, you do partial ISR, and for type 3, you do total ISR, and for type 4, you do APR. Very important, especially if you're starting to do laparoscopic TME, is patient selection. TME is one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult, uh, laparoscopic procedure in colorectal, and uh, you have to select your patients, and there are parameters to determine um, which uh, patient is more difficult than the other. So, includes a male, gender, pre-op RT, tumor localization, particularly the low rectal lesions, and the patient with high BMI. So, the, there's a difficulty grading score. I, I recommend that you do first the low difficulty patients in, uh, if you're starting to do lap TME. So I'll, I'll just go straight to uh, the technique. Here's a patient that we um, recently do, did in our... Sorry. We recently did in our center. It's a um, young female. Uh, the low BMI, the lesion at 6 cm from the anal verge, UT2 by uh, ultrasound and also by confirmed by MRI, pelvic MRI. So you have a, uh, standard steps for lap DME. The surgeon is usually in the right lower part of the patient, first assist on the opposite side. Position is uh, deep uh, or steep. Trendelenburg, so as to uh, allow the bowel to go to the right upper quadrant, and then you do your um, initial diagnostic laparoscopy, looking for metastasis, particularly in the liver, in the peritoneum, and put your omentum in above the liver, and then I usually put a gauze for hemostasis and for blocking some of the small bowel. The assistant usually holds the meso sigmoid mesorectum to expose the mesentery of the sigmoid and start your opening the peritoneum at the level of the sacral promontory. After the initial scoring, you'll see the right plane, the areolar, white areolar tissue, and then try to follow cephalad just below, stay just below your superior rectal artery in order to avoid injury to your superior hypogastric plexus. And you follow this to your IMA. You can either do a high ligation or low ligation. In this case, we did a low ligation just above the take of the, of the left colic artery since the patient has a redundant sigmoid. You, do, you can also do this for elderly patients, particularly patients with vascular problems. But you have to, if you do low ligation, you have to sweep, also include the lymph nodes of your IMA. And then do your medial to lateral dissection. Proceed with your uh, lateral dissection and do your splenic mobilization. The most crucial part, of course, is your pelvic or rectal dissection. So you dissect also through, in between your mesorectal fascia and visceral fascia, there's a clear areolar plane or tissue at that level. You avoid your hypogastric nerves. 
and usually try to start the dissection, the pelvic dissection, posteriorly, up to the level where you can dissect safely and then go to the right lateral side. Usually, in females, uh, if the uterus is small, don't need to uh, suture, it, it, suture it to the abdominal wall. My assistant can just lift the uterus and hold the rectum while I, my left hand hold the peritoneum. Monopolar dissection, I think, is still the best for uh, TME. Provides sharp dissection. And anteriorly, you have to be careful with uh, separating your rectum to your vagina because you can encounter bleeding easily in your vaginal layer. For males, the anterior dissection is a bit more difficult. Um, after your anterior peritoneal reflection, you'll encounter the seminal vesicle. And below that is your denonvillier fascia. If your lesion is anterior, you have to go anterior to your denonvillier fascia up to your rectoprostatic uh, level or fascia. And then go to your left side. The assistant usually holds the lateral peritoneum while your left hand holds the rectum for good traction and counter-traction to facilitate dissection. While in the pelvis, you will encounter accumulation of smoke. That's why, particularly in the posterior part, I would recommend using a, a dissector, either a hook or a spatula with an irrigator and a suction, uh, all-in-one instrument. Just continue your dissection. You can combine gentle, blunt dissection from time to time. Just stay uh, away from your mesorectal fascia for a complete specimen resection or excision and dissect up to the levator. But bef before you go to the coccyx or levator level, you have to transect your rec rectosacral ligament or fascia. So for females, you can easily reach uh, the levators in most of the cases, but for male, there will be some additional difficulty. So that's your rectosacral ligament. You have to transect that in order to proceed your dissection, particularly if you're doing ISR. Okay, you have to see the bare rectal cuff in order to assure that you have done a total mesorectal excision. That's very important. So proceeding with the ISR after um, dissection after your levators, this is a diff uh, different patient that we recently did and I assisted a, one of our fellow. It's a male patient post neoadjuvant chemo RT, lesion is around 3 cm level, 3 to 4 cm level. Use a Lone Star Retractor, in inject bupivacaine plus epinephrine in the intersphincteric groove, and then make a circumferential dissection through the intersphincteric groove. If you're doing a total intersphincteric section, if you're doing a partial, you start at the dentate level of the dentate line. So you just dissect, include the internal sphincter in your specimen, and then I, we usually close the rectal opening to prevent spe spillage of fecal material, and then we use the sutures for traction and counter-traction. So we continue dissection only using monopolar cautery circumferentially until you reach the the level of your levators, and then you reach your peritoneal cavity. Usually, start connecting your dissect, abdominal dissection posteriorly first, and then go around laterally, and then anteriorly. And then separate it anteriorly uh, through the rectourethralis muscle. Okay. And then 
extract the specimen transanally. Okay. And then close or anastomose, making sure that your transected edge is a, has a very good blood supply. And then include the anoderm and part of your external sphincter in your interrupted sutures, usually using absorbable 3 O sutures. So in summary, you have to, to do these procedures, TME and ISR, you have first to have a good patient selection, adhere to surgical oncology and TME principle at all times, keep the field dry as possible, gentle, meticulous, anatomic dissection is the key. You should have adequate mobilization, length, and blood supply of the bowel to be anastomosed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monroy. So we're going to move to the third uh, lecture, uh, third talk. Uh, the professor has been introduced yesterday, and he, I guess it needs no further introduction. He's going to talk about TATME. Professor Yoshiharu Sakai. What? Where is the first slide? Anyway. Um, sorry. Um, good morning, uh, the ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to uh, talk again at uh, TATME, but this today, uh, I would, the yesterday I overviewed the TATME, but today uh, I would like to describe the procedure of the TATME in detail. The ins instruments are very important to do the TATME because in order to keep a stable and clear vision. My preference, or we, our preference is an air seal. This is inevitable, very, very valuable to, to keep a clean, a clear vision. And in addition to the air seal, my preference is crystal vision. Crystal vision is working simultaneously with uh, with uh, the uh, evacuation, the evacuate the, the mist. Uh, this is not, not it, it still, uh, crystal vision doesn't, uh, is not working. Again, this is a natural, not, not, uh, not, not crystal vision is not working. So you can see the us. Uh, then I switch on the crystal vision. You can see the very, very clear the uh, surgical field. The smoke is evacuated simultaneously with the switch of the energy device. And the next important material is a platform. We have a several platform for TATME, zero point pass, zero point mini, and tail. And the third one is a scope, flexible or rigid scope. Um, you can use the flexible 3D uh, camera, but it's very difficult to uh, control the flexible camera in a small, narrow uh, space. I recommend you to the rigid, the 30 degrees scope. And this is an example using by use of a tail and hook for uh, anterior resection. But tail is uh, it's good, but it's very difficult to control the the, the control the, the direction depend on the, the, the step by step procedure. And this is uh, ISR by use of gel point mini, um, at the first step, we are dissecting the 
space between uh, internal and external iliac mus uh, 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 sphincter muscle, then close the anus, then put the gel point mini. And this is a procedure of the ISR following the put, putting the platform. The red color means a serrated muscle, and white color is a smooth muscle. So I'm dissecting between uh, the serrated muscle and the smooth muscle. And this is a posterior ligament. I just cut, I divide the, oh, this is a new renoma about there, so the, the inclusion of a new renoma is coming out. But anyway, uh, this is uh, the right side, the Fourth sacral nerve is now the preserved. But yesterday I mentioned that it's very easy to go into the lateral space. Why? Because it's very easy. <laughs> yeah, this is the most difficult part, anterior dissection. Posterior dissection first, then the lateral, and finally, we reached the anterior part, and I should combine the dissection line or di dividing line between the right and the left. And now I can identify the, the lower part of the prostate. If we can identify the prostate, the following procedure is very, very easy. Just the section along the prostate, along the neurovascular bundle, very simple. <coughs> so compared with the ISR, anterior resection is very easy because uh, we we can reach the prostate directly divide by dividing the, uh, the uh, anterior wall of the rectum. And this is the APR. The skin incision first, and the subcutaneous dissection, then we put the gel point mini just like the ISR. The following procedure is the same, so I can cancel. Okay, now I present my awful experience. This is a vascular injury, not, not the sacral the vessels. Very awful experience. Patient was a 52 years male, clinical T3 and a 2, and we are suspect of lateral ring node metastasis. So, the at that time, we did we do we were doing the clinical trial of chem, preoperative chemotherapy. So we uh, uh, administered the Folfox six course. Then the lateral lymph node was shrinked. And, oops. First, we are parceling suture. Then, mucosal dissection. Then, Dividing the posterior part, identify the, uh, the correct plane, fibrous tissue, but it's very easy to dissect too deep, too posterior.
it's too deep. It's near to the, the secular vasculature. But still, I kept the deep dissection. This, this is a lateral dissection. It's OK. Anterior dissection, still OK. And prostate. This is a low anterior dissection. So it's very easy to identify the prostate, as I mentioned. OK? Posterior dissection, still deep. Still deep. Don't follow this procedure. OK? Mm? And I couldn't the keep our clear the surgical field because um, a slight um, breathing occurred, and this is what it is. I didn't understand what it is at this procedure, and breathing occurred. Okay, it might be a posterior sacral. Okay, it's very easy to con control breathing with uh, the co soft coagulation. No, impossible. Breathing was getting the, the bigger and bigger, and I couldn't control. So I changed to the abdominal procedure. Conversion to the, the lap procedure. Oh, sorry. I packed the gouge as much as possible, then switched to the abdominal procedure, and the IMA is now the divided in the left, okay, and the posterior dissection, and communicate the space dissected below. Breathing is well controlled by packed gouge and open the anterior, the peritoneal reflection. Okay, no breathing, controlled well. And completely uh, divided, take out the rectum from the pelvis and go into the lateral lymph node dissection on the right side. Still, breathing controlled well, but what is this? What? This is a external iliac artery? What? <laughs> I damaged the external iliac from the below? I couldn't believe it. But I could keep my mind. And I controlled the breathing with left hand and dissection surrounding the external iliac. I changed the right side to the left side of the patient. And control point was controlled, a breathing point was controlled by left hand and dissection of the external iliac circumferentially and put the vascular cramp by assistant of both sides. Then I stitch. And this is a final view. Oh my goodness. I dissect below the pelvic nerve plexus and injured the external iliac artery. This is a very special, very, very special. I have never done with a conventional laparoscopic surgery. This is very specific to the TATME because at the, the beginning, we could not understand the clear landmark. So, Okay, another, the, 
over it, the experience. I <laughs> anyway, next, we should understand the surgical anatomy, okay? And avoid the excessive too lateral, too posterior dissection to, uh, to, uh, to, to avoid the injury. Anyway, abdominal navigation is very important. Abdominal navigation will help us to, to do the correct the dissection plane. Thank you very much. So thank you, Professor Sakai, for that uh, personal video, which was almost like watching a horror film. <laughs> she would, one would describe it. So the last speaker for, for this uh, morning session, again, needs no further introduction, but maybe as a, um, an addendum to the guy, he, he almost became a national player of basketball in his country, in Taiwan. So um, we wouldn't be wearing Air Jordans if he had proceeded to become a national player. We'd be wearing Air Williams. A Nike Air Williams, but uh, as luck would have it, the colorectal society in the world has this guy to help patients out. And he's going to talk about the management of complications of laryngostomosis, Professor William Chen. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And again, uh, good morning to everyone. And uh, I'd like to thank Chu Chip again and the organization for uh, this uh, fabulous meeting. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk on a common, a very common. Uh, problem in, uh, in colorectal surgery, which is the anastomotic leakage and how we manage it. I think this is the modern er uh, eras of a leakage rate. Uh, it runs about 10% uh, to 15% in general. And uh, well, the risk factor you can be, I think everyone knows this, tissue factor and also the patient related factors such as uh, male gender, obesity, hematologic, uh, nutritional, sepsis, and wound healing, and et cetera. And I think most commonly seen is the technical factor. This is the leak is, I, th I personally think is always caused by the, the doctor herself. I mean, patient related is not as much, but it's also always the blood supply, tension, and uh, you're oriented and distal obstruction levels and osmosis and operative time associated with it. And uh, instrument related, I mean, we always uh, blame on the stapling, misfire or misinformation, uh, dog gear and et cetera. And I think uh, this is uh, the rate, um, I'm sorry, I already showed this. And this is uh, the rate of, uh, the rate of a uh, minimally invasive surgery is about the same. And how about TATME? I think we went through this. It's about runs about 16.2 percent. My own my own series is about 14 percent for TATME. And I th if you look at into the database, if you if you have leak, I think if you have leak, I mean it costs you more. I think uh, the post-operative infection is increased if you have a leak, and also the re-emission rate would increase when you have a leak. And also the length of stay will cost you a lot of money. And also if you look at, uh, if you have leak and hospital costs and total emission would be higher, the cost of and pharmacies and other would be higher for patient with leaks. So actually, when it's leak, it's a uh, it's a, a very uh, I think uh, cat catastrophic uh, system uh, states for you, and uh, the I think I'm going to talk about the how you manage it, the management of the leak, and there are several options of managing the leak. I think uh, leak has a symptom. A lot of time you can you cannot detect leak by uh, image or by by clinical symptom. I think the most important thing is. On a lower interior section, you have to watch out if a patient has a watery diarrhea on the first date, and that probably would end up with leak, or your patient has a growing pain or back pain, complaint of back pain, you have to be aware that the leak is coming. 
So when leak, you have sepsis, peritonitis, abdominal pain. That's the following leaks. So, you, and if you cannot, for low interior section, if you cannot detect it with your fingers or you, with a clinical time, sign, sometimes you feel it with the finger, but it's asymptomatic. And also you can detect with a, a contracts, you can see a leak here, and also you can detect with the CT scan. And for management of the leak would be non-operative and operative. I'm going to quickly go over this. And for non-operative, well, percutaneous drainage is only for stable patient. And also transanal drainage, which I don't uh, usually do, uh, but uh, you can do this, but uh, I think it's not useful. For stenting, I don't recommend any stenting on the, on the, on the for, for leak in the lower interior section. I think it's a pain in the ass. If you do have a stent in it, I mean, the patient will complain of a severe anal pain, and I don't think it works well, uh, better. So how about sponge, uh, endo sponge? This is something that you can do, but uh, you have to go repeatedly wash out, and, uh, and it takes time. And glue. I don't recommend any of the glue for using for uh, if you detect any leak. I think it's only cost money and it's not useful. And when we have leak, we always uh, check on the, our abdomen with laparoscopy. Okay. So when it, when it's a uh, minor, not too many of the uh, fe feces. It's only location. Located in the pelvic, so we probably would do a loop elastomy or t -clastomy. And I personally would like to have a, putting a t -clastomy on it because I can wash out the distal rectum. So I don't recommend using an ileostomy if you have a leak and you go into it. So I always check with the coronoscopy doing, uh, doing a leak. When it's a leak like this, you you probably can check with the coronoscopy, and this is a very minor leak after cleaning out uh, the abdomen, the pelvics, and then we can primary closure, and they, if it's safe, you can do it with, with or without uh, a stoma. But uh, uh, for me, I'm uh, although I'm brave, but I'm brave, but I I always cover with the stoma after I stitch it, so it'll be easier for for you to to find the leak with the, with the I'm gonna, so you can suture it like this uh, with, uh, with, the, with the stitch. And after that, and you, can, you can go and, and check the coronoscopy again, see if there's any leak. And then we would check again with the uh, with coronoscopy, and if it's safe. And nowadays, I would check with uh, using ICG to check the blood supply. Uh, if it's okay, if it's a high rectum, I probably would not cover with the stoma. But uh, if, if it's a low rectum, I think you should cover with the stoma. I'm sorry. And then Hartman operation is one of the most common uh, procedure that we do if you find a leak like this and just take down your anastomosis. So, so for leak, uh, in my institute, uh, we always go in with laparoscopy. So we don't like to open up the abdomen when it's leak. I think when uh, it'll be easier for the patient after you clean up the tummy with the laparoscopy. So this is a, uh, a high anterior with leak. Uh, so we do a Hartman operation. So, so just take down and clean up the tummy. It's a time factor. I'm not going to go over this. And then also, this is a, you also can do a reanastomosis about this. After you clean up the, the leak on this particular patient, and then we resect the uh, stump again, and then We resect it again, and then a 
no, this this is a case with a primary uh, anosmosis, I think. Yeah, sorry. You can also do a primary anastomosis with this. And also a patient with ischemic change. Here. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, what's going on? It's not working. And then you resect the distal anast the anastomosis. We resect it and we clean the, the abdomen and mobilize the left side and cut the artery and we take down all the anastomosis. And following by, we would do, uh, we would perform uh, a re-anastomosis. So we would check, take down the entire T colon, mobilize the entire T colon. Okay, and then mobilize all the way to the right side. And then we do a retro edio, we create a retro edio tunnel, and then we will do the re anastomosis for the, for the leak. So we do this majority, uh, in the vast majority of the high, rect high rectum or middle rectum leak. For low rectum leak, we don't do this type of operation. And then we pull down uh, the embryo through the tunnel. So this is called an idiot. Uh, and there are also uh, another operation if you have, don't have enough bowel, and then you, have, you can flip the entire cecum. It's, it's called a uh, deployed operation. So, and then we do a reanosmosis with this. So you just take down the entire colon. <coughs> and then we do a re -anosmosis. I have, uh, okay. And also another case is we always clean up the tummy and then we can do a transanal repair, uh, which I used to do. You clean up from the bottom and then you repair with uh, under direct vision. But with the invention of the, the laparoscopy, I don't do that anymore. I will do a transanal, I'll do a transanal repair of the leak. This is what we do for majority of the lower interior section leak now. I mean, I will take the patient in if I, f if I uh, find that there is a leak, and then we will do uh, this procedure uh, transanally, either using a TEO uh, system or you can use a jail port system to, uh, to uh, restructure the anastomosis, okay? And this has been published in this year's uh, surgical endoscopy. And we found that uh, 13 patient with this, uh, with this procedure, uh, we found that 13 patient has a very good healing of anastomosis. So we, rec we recommend it on the on the uh, classification to B patient, you can take into it with the hybrid technique and then, and then do a repair of the anosmosis. But I don't recommend on the, the C patient, which is uh, more sick and you probably have to go in with laparoscopy or laparotomy. So this is how, this is our publication. We feel that hybrid technique is feasible and safe and potentially reduce the post-operative uh, mobility associated with the uh, repeat laparotomy and uh, anastomosis leakage. And I think transanal repair is a good option. I think for, pre for leak, I think prevention is the most important thing. Tension, adequate blood supply, use of ICG if available, and general condition of the patient should be considerate. Temporary stoma uh, for uh, CRT patient or hemodynamic un unstable patient, poor general condition and infected patient. And most important, the surgeon has to admit that you have a leak. So I think this is the most important. And this is what we uh, now currently use. We use ICG. Uh, I think uh, with ICG, you can see all the blood supply coming in. So uh, this is a very good method. And also in, uh, in robotic surgery, we have the ICG machine and hooked onto our SI, and you can, see the, you can also see the blood supply of it. 
And I think this is about it. And I thank you very much for your attention. And I'd like to invite all of you to our 10th anniversary of uh, International Colorectal Surgery Forum next year. Thank you. All right, thank you, William. So we'd like to ask the four speakers, Professor uh, Choi, Monroy, Sakai, and Chen, Professor Chen. Please come up the stage. We have about uh, 10 minutes for the question and answer portion of this session. Because after this, we'll have a short break and then there will be a cadaver hands-on workshop. So are there any I was told by Chuchip that those who are going to have the uh, to join the cadaver workshop, please proceed directly to the building for the cadaver workshop. You will have your break there, as well as for the instructors. Please proceed to the cadaver workshop building. Uh, there will be people outside to guide you as to where to go. Any any questions? For yes, Chuchip. Uh, hello. For for Professor Shea. Uh, I I uh, I enjoy your video using the ICG and pelvic node dissection. Uh, the question is uh, now it's become your standard, right, to use the IC, ICG in our case for for the I, for the pelvic node dissection. And um, do you have any uh, advice for some institution, including us, uh, our institution, uh, that uh, I? Not yet have the ICG. What what is your recommendation? I, ICG is actually uh, um, several purposes. The one is is remember is not to identify the metastatic lymph node, just to see the lymph, lymphatic channel and lymph node. And during the uh, dissection, sometimes you just uh, crash the lymph node. Mm -hmm. But if you see it, you, you must be more careful not to uh, crush it during the surgery. That's one. Second again is uh, the leak confirm. There is no uh, fluorescent positive uh, any tissues left. And so we, you remove that. The third one is more important thing is you can dissect it ex vivo and send to the pathologist. More, uh, you can have a more number of harvested lymph nodes and you will have less chance to have a look at the pathology examination. So there's the three purposes. If you have ICG, just do it. It's uh, no harm at all. But it's not very much, you know, uh, oncologically important because this is not to identify the metastatic lymph node, just the lymph node, lymphatic channel only. And, uh, another question is that regarding to your technique, because you show us the robotic approach, uh, how about the, the laparoscopy? Laparoscopy, my laparoscopy in uh, the lateral pelvic node section is, uh, is worse than the robotic. The reason why is my uh, endorheistic function and also the traction with my, one of my instruments is the key. You know, no need to help, the, no need from the assistant mode normally. I, I can do it. The uh, <clears throat> only thing, the difference between my laparoscopy and the robot is we uh, I dissect and I cut, divide more vessels, small vessels in laparoscopy. But in robotic, I, I preserve more small vessels. I don't know if this is, uh, you know, big difference or not in, in, in terms of the results. But my trends are, when I do laparoscopy, I 
cut small vessels together because it is quite difficult to preserve it. Yes, Professor. Yeah. I have a short question to Professor Sakai. The, as far as I know, the, you are uh, master of the abdominal uh, procedure with the laparoscopic technique. And then for you, the, I want to ask the, your indication for the transcendental TME at first, and then also the, um, is there any, the, during the transcendental procedure, is there any sign or uh, some, the, can you guess uh, the, oh, I'm on the wrong plane or something, yeah, then the, to, just to stop there. The, can you give us uh, some message for that? Yeah. Uh, indication. Yesterday I uh, mentioned that uh, indication has been changed for myself. Yeah. Uh, now the, I use uh, mainly a robot for a lower-rectal cancer operation, and uh, I enjoy it. And when I uh, some difficulty with uh, Da Vinci, then I switch to the TATME. So uh, almost all procedures are done by robot. So um, it's very easy to, uh, to identify the landmark from the below have already been almost all uh, area dissected. If we uh, don't dissect from top, still uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to do, identify the landmark, clear landmark. It's easy to lose the correct plane. The, this is my personal opinion, thank you, sorry. It means the, um, even the, without the dissection, the space from the offside is uh, it is uh, it's very hard to detect our mistake during the transcendental procedure. No sign or no easy to easy to lose our way. Yes, uh, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, most important landmark is uh, the fourth sacral knob, fourth sacral knob on both sides, and of course, and of course the anterior side, ventral side. But the, on the lateral side, we can see very small, tiny vessels to, uh, toward the, the lateral. That is, uh, no, 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 the, the medial. That is a good run. That, the tiny vessels surprising, uh, supplying the rectum. This is the lowest, lowest tiny vessel. If we can identify that, that those tiny vessels, it's very easy to identify the post sacral nerve, the lowest part of the pelvic nerve plexus. And now, the, some surgeons the prefer the, the, what do you say, the no, supine, no, 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 uh, crown. crown. Prone position for a TATME because um, the rectum is to move toward the head with uh, the uh, the head. Yes. yes. Okay, we have a question from Varut. Uh, my my questions go to Williams. Uh, thank you very much for your fantastic video and nice algorithm of the anatomic leakage management. I think the key to save the anatomosis is early detection. So I would like to ask you and maybe the whole panels, what is your protocol in post-operative period to early detections of the leakage? For example, do you measure the CRP in the, in the serums or in the drain, something like this? Thank you. Usually I would check the CRP for the first three days, I mean, continuously, which I often get, uh, get punished by the insurance company, but I don't care. I mean, it's, uh, I, I check that every increasingly, and then I'll suspect that well, I'll have a, and then, and then I'll check, I'll check on uh, the patient's symptoms. So if early detection, I don't wait. I mean, I just go, I'll just go. I think early repair will be better unless, uh, when it comes to later reconstruction of the anastomosis. So oh, if the CRP is rising, so you consider like CT scan with contrast? Yeah, but if it's uh, asymptomatic, I mean, just leave it alone. Uh, yeah. If it's uh, symptomatic and comes like fever or increase of heart rate, and then I'll be, 
I'll be scared of a leakage. So I'll be checking on the patient very often. Can we ask? Uh, can you answer the same question, Dr. Monroy? Early detection yeah, of leaks. I, I don't usually routinely use CRP. I can request for CBC to check for increased white count, but basically it's purely clinical for signs and symptoms, particularly tachycardia or even um, non-improvement uh, to the post-operative course. Can I ask uh, Professor Sakai, on, on your video you started out with the bottom first, right? So what if, if on this patient, if you started from the top, and then you come in from the bottom, would it avoid the injury of the X, you know? So would you suggest that if you do the TADME, you start it from the top always? Yeah. We, we, we should check the intra-abdominal situation, uh, whether the, the patient had a peritoneal metastasis or not. Then, then conventional TME. <laughs> and if we have uh, some difficult, you have another two approach from TATME. That is the best way for, for me. The way I do now is uh, take it all the way down and then I'll stop at where I'm not sure and then I'll come from the very little part. But usually you, if you plan, like last week I planned a TATME but I ended up with the lap TME. So usually it's gonna be beyond, you think you're gonna do a TATME but at the end, you finish it up with TME. So I, I think there is only a very few indication for T, TA, TME. I mean, at least for now, my experience. So, okay, well, last uh, question from Chuchip. Based, based on uh, your approach that you prefer right now, seems that you like to start from the top and then you reach to a certain point and you stop and then you go to the transano. And now you advise for the platform of TA, TME, but I look at your approach, knowing the way that you use like the open approach for the transanal ISR, I think it's pretty much the same. So uh, may I ask you for the, maybe both of you, what, what is um, the, the benefit of, I mean, if you go to pretty low and then you just need just a little bit, why don't you do it as knowing Show, just open technique. Yes, this is the only one uh, indication for me, transanal first, is ISR. So I used to just dissect and close the anus, but nowadays I dissect more, higher, to see the mesorectal fat, and then I stop. And I said, just three, four centimeters from, uh, from dentate line. Then much easier when I go back to top, top down, and I just uh, make a lung debut quite easily. But when I uh, used to do uh, uh, is, uh, just make a, the pulsing shoot and dissect mucosa, and then go to the uh, abdominal side and start it. But uh, finally, Anyways, I have to go to go back to the perineal side and dissect more. So now it's a little bit more transanal dissection. It, have, it helps me a lot from the top down. <laughs> well, same, um, I repeated the same answer. If I had the difficulty from the, the difficulty of dissection from the top. A change, mm -hmm. but sometimes I don't need the TTME, just the under direct vision. But depend on the the, the length of inner, inner canals or patient or body shape and so on. Sorry, I had no clear <laughs> definition <laughs> indication. Well, I think the only benefit to use I think Chuchi's question is you can do it like. Uh, uh, and we're all doing it, you can see directly, but why use the TATME method, is that right? Platform. Yeah, platform. I think if you, lower, yeah. The only, the only benefit, the only benefit is you can see well. 
instead of having, you know, that's the only benefit. I mean, I can see better with the with the camera. But for, those, for your eyes, yeah, you yeah. use open, right? Two, two three centimeters Direct. is no need to laparoscopy, or no need to magnify the one. So if you go up, uh, it's much better to use the laparoscopy or LCR and everything. I, I see know. Professor Chen use uh, robotic on the, on the <laughs> transanal <laughs> side. <laughs> Okay, excuse me. Unfortunately, I have to play the bad guy here. <laughs> I have to cut it short because we're 20 minutes behind schedule. So if you have any questions, you please feel free to approach the speakers anytime. Let's give them another round of applause. And with that, I'd like to close this morning's uh, session. Thank you. Okay. So thank you for the presentation. That was really interesting. For delegate.